Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the law. My name is Joseph Akable and today I sit in for your regular host, Samson Ladi Anyanini. We are discussing an issue of major concern, accidents on our roads. There are laws that are in place geared at ensuring that the road is safety for all of us. I'm talking about road traffic offences and we are discussing traffic offences and the law. Quite recently, we secured data from the Road Safety Authority and the MTTD for that matter that gives some worrying statistics about accidents on Ghana's roads. Now, our research team here at Joy News, they have broken down the data in a manner that is very simple for you to comprehend. And so we are going to go through that to get a sense of what the situation is. First, we are looking at deaths on the roads. 1,450 lives have been lost as a result of road accidents. By way of injuries, we are looking at 8,188. And it's worth noting that a lot of these accidents are individuals who could become lawyers, judges, doctors. Some of them could even become presidents. Their lives are gone for good. By injuries, there are some who have suffered injuries that have been incapacitated for good. They can't work any longer and they increase the dependency ratio. Another thing we look at has to do with the motor traffic offenses and the total cases that were recorded within the period under review are talking about January to June 2021, 2,898. Now, if you compare it to the same period, 2020, you realize that it was less than 1,850. Then what we decided to look at is the types of offenses that are happening. We decided to do a breakdown to give you a sense of what laws people are obeying and which laws they are falling foul of. And we realized that driving without license is a major concern. 532 cases recorded, while that of expired documents stands at 306. We also have drunk driving, which the lawyers will call a driving under the influence of a substance or alcohol. That's one doing 105. And you have not wearing helmets following in at 102. Some other offenses still talking about one out ties, overloading, over speeding, also continuing there. Then these are the number of cases that we take into court because under the rules, when you fall foul of the law, we take you over to court and ensure that you are punished. But what happened when you got into the courts? We can see it right here. You realize that 1,900 of the 2,000 plus cases that we talked about earlier, we had the individuals being convicted. Those who are awaiting trial stand at 274 and those under investigation 633, bench warrant 43 individuals who after committing a crime they could not be found and the court issued warrants for the arrest, we have 43. Those who have been jailed are 11 and those discharged 43. Now I'm sure you are wondering, there's a bit of a disparity of sorts. You see that those who have been convicted, 1,900, while those who have been jailed are 11. And so you'll be wondering that, why is it that you have a lot of people being convicted yet only few people in jail? The next slide explains that very much. If you go into the next slide, you can see clearly that it has to do with the fact that under the Traffic Offenses Act, the Road Traffic Act, what we have is that when you commit any of those offenses listed there, there are two options. Either you are given a jail time or you are fined. And we've seen a lot of the time is the fine that is imposed. And so that is how come the state has been able to rake in a little over a million cities in terms of January to June uh, 2021. And so that is the situation by way of the statistics. It doesn't look good and it's worrying. We'll be discussing that. After the MTTD had released this data, they undertook some operation in some parts of Accra to clamp down on those who are falling foul of the law. My colleague Judith Awachitando was with the team and filed this report. I'm telling you I'm right. I, am, I understood, my, understood it I'm wrong. So are you ready to pay the consequences? Because in, you are aware this, and you are still... That's what I'm telling you. That it's something new that just happened. And this world, now in Ghana, things are very hard. I won't lie to you. So we are standing currently at the Wudome roundabout where the police MTTD as well as the DVLA have been clamping down cars with fake or embellished number plates. Now apart from that, other traffic offences such as fake licences as well as the use of tinted glasses are also being checked. Some of the drivers however argued with officials. Okay. It means so are you give. ready to face the consequences of that? Oh. Driving with an expired DP. Bro, bro, bro. Okay. Yes, we Open are processing them. you for court. For driving with an expired DP. Oh, grab the new. Okay. Grab the new. MY. 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 It's as oh. simple as that. We are processing him for court. For driving with an expired DP. Yes, uh, originally we, we work with alphabet. January was A. So he is having C, that is March, and we are now in July. So we are now in E, whilst he is still using C, which is March. Yes, yeah, so 
there's a need for us to process him for court. One of the key offences was the embellishment of the vehicle number plates, contrary to the road traffic regulations, which the director of driver testing, training and licensing, Joseph Obosu, explains presents a security threat. Yeah, of late, we have seen that people are actually altering the, the normal plates with colours and it is against the law. It's a security threat also. And it's also obscure the, the normal plates. And that is exactly what we are here to announce to the general public that those who are adding colours to the normal plate that we have handed over to them, they should desist of doing that. As when, they, when, when we get hold of them, we will process them to court. In situations where the officials could, they removed the films on tinted windows. Mr. Obosu further explained the law requires that occupants of vehicles in motion be seen. It has to be seen, to be seen. You see, and in the night, tinted, tinted, is it front or the side? The side, yeah. The law says it has to be seen. The driver must be seen. Must be seen. You see, uh -huh. so when you, when you tinted it, it means that uh, you have a secret agenda of which you want to, uh -huh. so when you get hold of you, you have to, yeah, it is by law, you shouldn't tint your windscreen or that of the door glasses. He advised motorists to ensure they comply with the road traffic regulations to avoid offending the law. About 61 vehicles have been apprehended with various road traffic offences. To some, they have not faced their uh, roadworthy sticker. Since to some, also they are using fake certificates, and to some, also uh, the seating arrangement is very poor. We gave them 19 seats, but they have fitted 24, 23 seats, which is an offense. So I think so far so good. We have also apprehended a number of vehicles which have been uh, cars which they have tinted their, the, the windscreens and the, the, the dog grass, which is also an offense. We are pleading to the general public that they should desist from doing that. Any time that we get hold of them, we will process them to court. Judith, our Chetando joining. So you heard that report there by Judith talking about the operation that was undertaken by the police MTTD. Uh, joining us for today's discussion, we have Theoflos Donko, his managing partner at the Legal Relief Trust. He joins us via Zoom. Mr. Donko, welcome. You can unmute your microphone and, and so I can hear you, sir. We also have joining us for this important discussion, Kwame Kodua Etuyahini is the head of uh, regulations, inspections, and compliance at the National Road Safety Authority. Uh, Mr. Kodua, thanks for joining us. Joseph, thanks for having us, too. I mean, I think it's fair I state clearly that Mr. Etuyahini <laughs> taught me at the faculty uh, not too long ago, and so it's my lecturer. I'm glad that you could join us here. Eh? Pleasure having me on your show. I would want to start with you first, Mr. Tuyangine. I mean, the data that has been released uh, for the first half of the year, it, it raises lots of concerns. I mean, I remember that of the first quarter, very similar trend, lots of accidents, lots of deaths, lots of offenses being committed. This must be of concern to the Road Safety Authority. That is correct. Um, it's beyond the institution, it's also of concern to us as um, employees of the authority. I mean, by and large, it reflects the level of um, discipline we have on our roads, and it reflects the, the extent of exposure um, to these incidents as, as users of the road. I am particularly happy that you had to pick on this subject matter, so that in addition to all the other conversation points in trying to reverse the trend, Potentially, we may want to begin to look at the critical but um, often ignored part of the puzzle, which is enforcement and uh, um, the magnitude, or if you like, the, the, the impact of, of this uh, very important measure. 
to improve in the, the number. So we are we are worried. And you know that there are quite a number of things being that um, what it says is that we must do more than we are doing at present. Each year we add on to the numbers in terms of um, road users, persons qualifying to drive, we add on to the numbers in terms of um, vehicles uh, joining the, the national fleet. We haven't had as much corresponding increase in the road network yet these numbers continue to, to go up. That's mm. no excuse. Mm. If we're to get our acts together, I mean, related stakeholder institutions, there's a bit more we can achieve with the given, uh, given the, the context of where we stand at present. Enforcement is such a major thing. I was just looking at the numbers. And I, I think that the, the numbers that even end up to the courts are way, way below the numbers that are apprehended. And even that, um, you want to ask whether the consequences are punitive enough as to be able to achieve a certain effect um, for, for those that end up with convictions. Uh, I think in the course of the discussion, we may have the opportunity to raise the concepts. Yes, we'll definitely come to that. Uh, let me pick the initial comments of uh, Mr. Donko. I mean, you are a lawyer, you handle some of these cases, you represent various clients as well. From a legal standpoint, uh, what, in your view, is accounting for this, uh, this worrying trend? Hello, Blay. Uh, we don't seem to have uh, the attention of uh, Hello. Mr. Blay, can Hello. you hear yeah, me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead, sir. I think that my initial comments are that uh, the road traffic act and its amendments and the road traffic regulation had made enough provision to make sure that every road user who complies and every road user who is on the road is safe. But what I would say is that there is a lot of indiscipline on the road. We don't obey our road traffic regulation on the road. And I think that there is a low level of education and everybody who thinks that he can drive will jump on the street and start driving, which is one of the problems. Because when I get clients and you begin to have conference with them, you realize that they do not have knowledge of our road safety regulations. Mm, interested, and we'll be talking about a bit of those uh, laws quite shortly. But what we did was that we interacted with some individuals on the streets of Accra to find out uh, what they know exactly about some of these offenses. We can uh, take a listen to them first, then we'll settle in for the discussion properly where we are going to touch on various offenses. Yes, I think uh, the traffic offenses are, have a lot of, um, you know, offenses and they are correlating punishment. One of the very interesting ones that I recently got to find out is uh, about how it is an offense to have a child that is uh, less than five years old on the front seat of any vehicle that you know you are driving and you know it, it, the the act says you are liable to some six months in prison and some hundred penalty units or something like that which is very interesting to me because as a child way below five i was always on the front seat of my father's car usually without a seat belt and things like that so this tells us how you know a lot of people have breached many many parts of this particular uh, um, act if you are a driver and then uh, uh, maybe a party street crossing and then you know that that place when you are getting there you have to slow down you know that the people are the people be passing that place and then uh, maybe you are you are watching the roadside and your mind is not on the on, on the road and then you hit somebody if you hit somebody uh, maybe uh, police will, police people will come in and then survey the area and then after that maybe they will check your driving lances. If you do, if they check your driving lances, and then your your lances is correct, that means they will send you to court, and then they will find you some um, some money, maybe hundred million or two hundred million. If you don't get that money, that means they will send you to a jail, like two years or three years. So this is what I know about the the law. I know drink driving. I also know of um, speeding, over speeding, and um, for loading, yes. I know 
was driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, yes. And to my take on the exact penalties ascribed to these kind of offenses, I can't really tell. But I know of being fined by law and also being imprisoned. Some of the things that can be done to reduce road crashes. Uh, one, the road networks. If we engineer the roads very well, like they do in the Western world, I think it will help. Example, road markings. You know, most of our roads don't have the markings. So uh, people or drivers just drive blindly. That is one. And driver orientation. I think uh, some people just know the law uh, on the surface, but not all. And uh, it creates the impression, you know, the driver might be doing something wrong, but to him, he thinks uh, it's right. For example, when you get to a, a cross junction, it's first come, first serve. But everybody feels it's the, uh, it's the survival of the fittest. Our roots have become something like a jungle. I would say we have a part to play as citizens and also the, the government also has its own part to play. And so as citizens of this very country, I think we need to be educated and then be very much aware of ourselves being on the road and things that could happen to us while we are walking on the road. As it says, um, it's an accident. No one planned it. Okay, so you must be very careful when you're using the road as a pedestrian and also as a driver. So that is some of you sharing your views with us as to what you know about those offences. I would like to start with uh, Mr. Donko. And what we are going to do is that in terms of the data from the Road Safety Authority and the MTTD for that matter, there are some offences that are the main offences that are being committed by people. And so the first one is that of driving without a licence. And that is under Section 53 of the Road Traffic Act. That is Act 683. And Mr. Donko, if you can hear me, I just want to find out from you, uh, in simple terms to the ordinary man, what is this offence about? Simple terms is that before a person can drive any form of motor vehicle, the person must be licensed by the driver and vehicle authority. And this license is not any license that you can drive without, you must drive a particular car with that kind of class of car. So we have uh, cars, that are saloon cars, we have tractors, we have articulators. And this class of cars requires a class of license to drive. So the first point is that before you drive a motor vehicle, you must be licensed by the DVLA to be on the road. So if you're on the road driving and you are found without a driving license, it means that you have committed an offense. Mm. So in simple terms, before you drive, you must possess a driving license of that class of car before you can be on the road. So okay. if you don't have a license, you don't have a business to be on the road. Then and the, if the... your license has also expired, you are not certified to be on the road. So you cannot be on the road. Mm. And you make an interesting point about the class of cars. Actually, I'm holding my license. So it's actually a class B license. And if you turn it back, the class B indicates that you can drive cars, cross country, minibuses, and pickup vehicles. Then in terms of the passenger, you are told that between one and 15 passengers. And so what you are saying is that if I'm found driving a car that is, say, a class D, then clearly I'm in breach of this law. You are in breach of this law. So if you want to drive a class D car, you must go back to the vehicle and licensing authority to make sure that you require the requisite class of car uh, license before you can drive that car. So if the policeman stops you and he checks your license and realize that you are driving a class D, whilst you possess a class B license, you have breached the law. How does the punishment regime look like? I think that the punishment regime is okay. But the, the difficulty I have is that the number of courts that we have available to deal with these traffic offenses. Because you and I, we drive every day. So we have all come to the judges and the magistrates who handle these cases. I've come to realize that because there is an option of a fine, if you read the punishment regimes, you realize that the law will say that a fine 
or an imprisonment, or both. So if the magistrate decide can give you a fine, the magistrate can decide to give you a custodial sentence or both. But because our prisons are choked, we don't have good facilities or we don't have enough prison space, the magistrates tend to give the convicts fines instead of custodial sentences. Mm. Uh, Mr. Tiyayene, I don't know whether you agree with him on the point about the punishment regime. And I'm looking at it. So in terms of the amendment act that was done, the one that's reduced uh, the punishment by way of the penalty units, if you look at the offense of any issues related to license, so you're looking at the fine of not less than 50 penalty units and not exceeding 100 penalty units, or a term of imprisonment not exceeding two years or both. Penalty units, 12 cities, so you're looking at around 600 cities. And your data shows that a lot of people are driving without uh, licenses. Uh, I mean, what does your outfit make of this regime and why do you think a lot of people are still driving without licenses? The most committed offense the first six months of the year. Yes, uh, Joseph, I think for me, I think that the punishment regime is, is too uh, mild, given the, the impact of the offense. See, to come on the road, the road is a very risky environment. And we cannot assume that uh, you have a license and you have been licensed to drive, yet you don't have the license with you. Or um, it is for a purpose that the licensing authority has found a need to classify uh, the various uh, licenses on, a, on account of the complexity that come with the various classes of vehicle. So uh, if you are licensed to drive, say, a class C vehicle, and yet with a class B vehicle, you appear to be on the road, I think that uh, it is such a concern that must impose or return a very deterrent uh, punishment from what you have read um, 50 penalty units up to uh, about a hundred there about uh, I, I do not think it is deterring enough and that to my mind is why a lot more people find encouragement to run the risk to come on the road to drive without these um, use requirements so for a good reason the law says that these, these are use requirements to bring a vehicle onto the road which is such a major risk factor, which if not handled properly with the necessary competencies for a particular class of vehicle, you may occasion an accident which may lead to loss of lives and damage to property. So how, how to my mind, um, how can we conspire to make uh, the punishment rather an incentive for people to, to breach the law? It is one of the offenses that I think if we had the opportunity we must begin to uh, have a rethink of the penalty regime. And, and I, I also see something from the data that the police MTTD put out. I mean, if you compare the number of cases that were taken to court, and so you have about 2,000 plus cases, then you just have just about 11 people being jailed. And so you see that the legal regime provides two options, either a fine or a jail time. And we see that a lot of uh, the, the courts tend to lean towards the imposition of the fine. Yes, uh, I, would, I would agree with Donko. I think uh, the court is often uh, not aligned to the option for a custodial sentence because of all the issues that we are familiar with. And until uh, we seek to have some improvement on that side of the coin, um, you, you can't fault the court that much. These are um, quote and unquote minor offenses, and if there's opportunity for a fine, why? Um, look in that direction. But can we make the fines a bit more biting or attractive to create more uh, deterrence for those who um, offend these laws? I think that is an option that we may begin to consider. But to act also in the law, I think in LI 2180 regulation 43 or 4, it provides for an opportunity for training. So if you were to be involved in an accident and you find your way up to the court, or if you were to be convicted of any of the three major offenses, the court has the opportunity to also commit you to training. And, and for the life of this ally, we haven't seen as much of it, even though at the very onset of its implementation, we had, uh, we had um, 
we have taken interest to try to take the, the judiciary on, on Samson Stiles and on the Eves. Maybe it's about time that we take a second look at that. So that in addition to the fines that you pay, if you were to be committed to training, uh, go back to school uh, at your own cost before you are allowed to come back on the road merely on account that you didn't find the need. You, 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 don't, you, you, you didn't appear to appreciate the, the, the relevance, the need to have a license that uh, commensurate with the class of vehicle you drive, or the need to have your license whilst on the road. I think one would begin to create a bit of inconvenience for these drivers. In addition to the fines that are imposed, somehow they may begin to take all of us seriously. Mm, interesting. Let me come back to you, Mr. Donko. I mean, another offense that we see happening in terms of the ranking, uh, when people have licenses, they get onto the road, but they, dri they drive under the influence of various substances. And that specifically is in uh, Section 4. It's titled Driving Under the Influence of Alcohol or Drugs. I mean, what must we understand about this particular provision, Mr. Donko? The law is that once you decide to go behind the wheels of a car, you are not supposed to take in any substance that will influence the normal functioning of your body or your brain. So anything that influences you or take away your ability to think as a normal human being, when you are under that circumstances and that the, you are arrested, most, most regularly what we normally test is the alcohol and you realize that the police have guns that they use to test the alcohol level when it is not within the normal range then it means that you have breached the law and if you are found guilty after a summary trial but what i've observed is that our drivers do not, our police do not have the current equipment to detect the alcohol level when you are driving. I think that they are still using the old equipment. So it becomes difficult for the police to be able to prove some of these things. And because when the police are not many on the road, the MTTD, they are not many on the road to check some of these things. We get away with some of these things. So anytime a Ghanaian or anybody within the jurisdiction of Ghana decide to drive, you must not be under the influence of any substance. But mostly what we hear is alcohol, alcohol, alcohol. Because that one, the police have equipment to test on the spot and detect that within the range in which they took your breath, it was above the normal range. That is where they arranged them before court. So once you are under the influence of alcohol, you are not permitted, you are not allowed to drink. For the fact that you are licensed to be on the road does not mean that any time that you feel you want to be on the road. Because these are part of the road regulations. Once you are under the influence of alcohol, you are not supposed to drink. You are not supposed to drive, excuse me. Because life and the property of other people are be in danger, not only on the the one who is driving the car, but other road users, because you are not alone on the road. So anybody who is found under the influence of any substance, that takes away the normal thinking, the normal behavior of a human being, you are in breach of the law. I see. Uh, Mr. Tuyane, the punishment regime for this particular offense, 50 penalty units, that is 600 cities, and six months, or in the alternative, six months in jail. We come back to the same challenge again. Yes, because uh, you see, before the amendment, um, you look at this. Uh, you, look, you look at most of these offences um, as having uh, close to about tenfold. So, with the amendment, what we did uh, was to dilute the penalties by ninety percent and, and retain just ten of the original intention of Parliament. So, look at this: the offence of driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs, as my um, colleague has explained, is one of three offenses defined under the law as major offenses, major, major offenses. <laughs> you and I appreciate that um, in the course of driving, like he explained, one requires the need of 
uh, uh, there's a need to maintain a certain maximum level of concentration. Within the law in general, it even imposes an obligation on the driver that where you are even on a medication, uh, uh, properly prescribed by your doctor, which creates, which creates a bit of discomfort for uh, your use of the road. You're under duty to make those exclusions. How much more when you go on your own for it to take alcohol and yet um, get into the environment? And when all of this lead to um, the undesired consequences, the law says how much do you pay? It's a 600 cities. I, I think we must begin to look at these matters dispassionately. Mm -hmm. You see, in 2004, for good reason, I think the original intention um, was right. However, uh, out of public agitations and desire to take a second look at it, uh, we will probably end up throwing the, the baby with the bath water and, and diluted uh, the, the, the effect that was intended um, from these new laws. So if you're seeing um, 120 20 penalty units, potentially in the original legislation, uh, this would have been an offense that would have returned about uh, 2,000 or so, or over 1,000 penalty units. In I fact, think. in the previous if offense, drink, in the previous law, the, the it had between 200 and... Yes. It had about 250 penalty units, not exceeding 500. So between 250 and 500. Uh, so 500 would have, uh, you know, about 6,000 Ghana. Yeah. And the mere fact that you go to take a bottle of um, alcohol, beer, or a shot of your popular whiskey. If that could um, return a fine of about 6,000 Ghana cities, in addition to all the other consequences, which may include a suspension of the license and a commitment for you to go to trading and all of it, then um, road users and drivers could do respect to begin to take other road users serious. But as it is, where the courts have shown that they are hesitant to give custodial sentences. And you go to take alcohol, and there's a potential that that um, independent decision you took may lead to about 20 or more people under your control uh, getting into these unfortunate incidents. I, I think that uh, the penalty is not commensurate with the, um, with the offense. And given the opportunity, we probably would have to start rethinking the penalty. Mm -hmm. Mm. At the very least, for the offenses that the law, for good reason, consider or considers as, as major offenses. So drink driving is one, careless driving is the other, and dangerous driving. Maybe we should take a second look at um, the, 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 the penalty review for these offenses and others that are very, um, that are imagined to be disturbing. Uh, I'll stay with you, Mr. Tuyane. I mean, there is this, I don't know whether we are in a position to tell and this new trend of people driving and using mobile phones. Whether we are in a position to tell, we have data that indicates how that contributes to accidents. Do, uh, do we have a sense of that? Uh, we had done a study about two or three years ago. Uh, yes, uh, destructive driving, it, it was becoming a bit problematic, particularly for um, um, drivers in urbanized environments, most of which, uh, most of them were, were private vehicle drivers. And, then, and when you take an observational study around town, we, we, see, the, we see them all the time. Um, in traffic, the, the guy is on his phone, either on WhatsApp, texting, or, or, or driving whilst on the phone. And they are creating uh, some, some difficulties. You see, the police may apprehend you for the mere fact that you drive whilst on the phone. But when that act has occasioned an accident, depending on whether there were bodily injuries or otherwise, they may choose to ignore that law and use that that as a basis to um, prosecute you under one of the two major offenses, which is either dangerous driving or, or careless driving. Because these are offenses which require that, at the very least, when you come in the environment, you must not use the road in ways that shows disrespect to other road users, whilst maintaining a high level of concentration. Um, from, the, from the numbers of cases that are going to court, I'm unable to confirm that the trend reflects the cases that go to court. And these are pointers that, that our friends for the police must begin to take on uh, in order to, to make a clear statement of these um, unfortunate developments. Mm.
if you are just joining us, I mean, the point you are making is that when you are driving and you are using your phone, you commit an offense. And specifically, it's provided for under the LI, the regulations, uh, 107. It says, a person shall not drive a motor vehicle on a road or in a public place while holding, using or operating a cellular or mobile telephone or any other communication device in one or both hands. Then yeah. two of it says, a person shall not supervise the holder of a learner's license whilst the person who is driving the vehicle is using a handheld mobile telephone or a handheld device of a kind specified in sub-regulation 5. Uh, I want to come yeah, to so you. When you are okay, so when you are that the police is at liberty to elect which may please them. So the mere fact that you are doing that is a strict liability offense. The evidence is that you are using it whilst driving. They may go under 107. Alternatively, they may choose to treat that as careless and inconsiderate driving. Because the fact that uh, you use a phone whilst a vehicle is in motion, uh, with all intents, that could be distracting and disrespectful to others that may be in the environment. So depending on the circumstances, they may choose to come under either, either of them. But however you look at it, uh, when you look at the number of cases um, going to court, you don't get the impression that um, the, the practice as it's emerged and the evidence we see on the streets uh, reflect in the number of cases going to court on account of these offenses. I mean, the, the obvious response could perhaps be that maybe the state is not prosecuting that enough. Because if you look at the data from the police MTTD, the issue of not wearing seatbelts is one of the least committed offenses. But even driving to the studio today, I see even our commercial vehicles in town, they have no provision for seat belts. Yes, um, I mean, that's a discussion for um, <laughs> maybe another day. But, but that's the, the reality. Uh, and I must also say that uh, the, the seat belt compliance um, level appears to have improved over the period. Nonetheless, there are still issues, especially to do with the commercial um, vehicles, some of which do not have these, but these, um, these belts. And we, we all need to figure out a way to begin to enforce that part of, that part of our law. Mm. Uh, we'll be taking a break shortly, but before that, I just want to pick uh, Mr. Donko's view on an, an important issue that I've realized with regards to uh, this particular section having to do with use of mobile phones. Now, one thing that I see is that the law sticks to either your right hand or your left hand. These days, they are very fanciful gadgets that enable people to just put uh, their phones in the middle of the car and they drive and they are distracted anyways. There are those who are also using it as their navigation system. They are being distracted. But you see clearly that the law says when you are using it, a person shall not drive a motor vehicle on a road or in a public place while holding. So I guess perhaps it could be using or operating a cellular or mobile phone or any other. I guess it will fall within the using part of it. Hello, Mr. Donko. The, the law is clear on this matter. What the intention of the drafter of this law is that as long as you are driving a motor vehicle, you are not allowed to use a mobile or telephone equipment. The drafter, uh, this law was introduced after we started using mobile phones. And uh, the law came into being because they realized that the number of accidents with people using mobile phone was increasing. That is why. So if you are found using mobile phone, the word is using. So if you are using mobile phone for navigating, making call, texting, the word is using. Once you, are, you have something to do with the mobile phone whilst you are driving, you have committed an offense per the law under the road traffic regulations. How about those who use these modern vehicles that has a navigation system in the middle? I do not think that the intention of the lawmaker is that the navigating uh, system is part of helping you to drive the vehicle, if I understand you very well. Yes. But those, uh, the new, uh, the Uber and the boat drivers, who now will be using their mobile phone to navigate and touching them, trying to get their location. If you look at the intent of the law, the spirit of the law, they are not required to do that. 
I see. Interesting. Uh, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, there are some other interesting laws that we have to talk about. I'll tell you about why when you are driving a car and you have a child who is less than five years of age sitting by you at the front seat, you have committed an offense. We'll be right back. You are still live on the Joy News channel and the show is the law and I'm having a discussion about traffic offense and the law with Kwame Kudwia Tiahini of the National Road Safety Authority and Theoflos Donko, a private legal practitioner. I mean, in between taking a break, uh, Mr. Tiahini, lots of comments have come in on the back of uh, the point about the mobile phones and the navigation system and everything. There are some who would view that there's a problem with the law. Is this something that you agree with? Because the argument is that these days, there are a lot of places that you go to that you can't simply find a head or tail. So why should it be an offense that is on a navigation system? And so because the law didn't say a navigation system and simply said a mobile phone, once I've just transferred the same navigation system onto my phone and using it, it becomes a problem. Else, all the Uber drivers will be in jail. <laughs> yes, this is, I, I recall that there were, this was such a contentious matter in Parliament at the time that um, the law was going through um, the, the requisite processes. And uh, part of the argument from sections of Parliament then was that to stretch the law um, to the point that uh, you cannot hold a device or, or if the law were to uh, relate to communication, uh, without having regard to whether you hold a device or not, then uh, it may also uh, debar us from having conversations whilst vehicles are um, in motion. So there was a lot of back and forth at the time, and in the wisdom of Parliament, uh, they decided that at the time we potentially would want to look at the distraction that comes with using a handheld device, i.e. holding a phone possibly with one hand whilst driving with the other, or um, using the phone for text messaging and, and WhatsApping as, they, as it's uh, become very familiar these days whilst, whilst driving. The overall intent is that when you get on the road behind the wheels, you must give the task of driving a bit more attention. You should not be distracted by these level of uh, devices or gadgets. But yes, that was a law in two for and later 2012. I mean, it's, it's been close to about 10 years now. And between then and now, um, vehicle architecture has seen some significant improvements. The good thing is that, as I speak with you, the Ministry of Transport is taking steps to, to review portions of, of the law, the LI, as well as the Act. And maybe given the opportunity, we may all want to reflect deeply on that aspect of the law in view of um, emerging trends and issues to see what that the status quo would be would have to remain or we need to take a second look at um, the scope of the law but otherwise um, it was debated um, um, significantly in parliament and i i recall the, the intensity of the debate in parliament and ultimately um, we we decided on the current state as, as, as we find in the law. But maybe it's just time for us to take a second look at it. Okay. Uh, let me come to you, Mr. Donko, now. There's this other offence at Section uh, 14. It's titled Carrying of Children in Motor Vehicles. And it specifically reads that a person who drives a motor vehicle on a road when a child of five years or under five years is in the front seat of the motor vehicle commits an offence and is liable on summary conviction to a fine not exceeding 100 penalty units or a term of imprisonment not exceeding six months or to both the fine and the imprisonment. So I will shortly check in terms of the regulation, but if you can explain to us what, what this is about. What it means is that so long as you drive a car and a child, a child is in the car and he sees at the front seat, that is the seat by the driver, that is the seat at the right hand side of the driver. And that child is found to be five years or less, you have committed an offense. So what it means is that once you are driving a car with a child in the car, that child should automatically be at the back seat. Once the child is found who is five years or less, found in the front seat of the child of the car 
It means that you have committed an offense, and that offense is punishable by law. So what it means in ordinary terms is that once you are driving a car and the child is five years or less, that child must automatically be at the back of the car. At times we see parents even carrying children on their laps whilst they are driving because the children is not giving them attention or the children want them to be, to be with their daddy or their, the one who is driving the car. So all these are offenses that is prescribed by law. And in terms what of I would the, say that the, the rationale regime. for this law is that okay, once you're on the street driving, you are not supposed to be distracted. You must concentrate on whatever you are doing. That is the aim of the law. It means that you must focus. And when the child is seated by you and the child is distracting you, you are going to be a danger to other road users. So the, the aim of the law is to make sure that once you are driving, the child does not detract you from being in control. Because the law is that once you sit behind the car, you are in control of the car. So once you are controlling the car, there must not be anything that would disturb you to focus on the road, to focus on other road users. So once the child is less than five years or five years, and you put the child in front of the car. That is the seat by the driver. You have committed an offense. Interesting. And I was looking at uh, the penalty regime for this particular offense of driving with someone less than five years at the front seat. In terms of the new, the amendment that was done in 2012, so it's currently 10 penalty units or a term of imprisonment not exceeding four months or both. And so that is it, the, the state of the law as assistance now. And the phone lines are open now. If you have any question and you want to ask our guest, you can uh, call into the show and ask those questions. So I'll go to Mr. Etienne on this. From a safety angle, I mean, what, what, what's your view on this requirement of not having the children by the drivers? Yes, um, so I, I mean, it's consistent with the national best practice, and my colleague explains the rationale uh, perfectly, that it is to avoid needless destruction uh, from kids. And maybe to add that um, they are also very vulnerable. Um, if they were to suffer a crash uh, when in the front seat, um, the effect of secondary pollution on them is much severe than it is on adults, um, road users or adult passengers. But ultimately, um, if they have to be in the vehicle, they must be at the back seat and not in the front. And even at the back, they might, they might have to be in child restraint devices so that they can still um, comport themselves whilst they do not distract the, the very important responsibility of the driver whilst, whilst the vehicle is in motion. I found something very interesting at section 119. Um, a lot of the time you see people who are driving in town and the police guys stop them and they speed off. Apparently it's an offense. Section 119 says powers of police officers and other authorized persons and so a person driving a motor vehicle or riding a cycle on a road shall stop the motor vehicle or cycle on being required to do so by a police officer or a person authorized by the minister in writing. Uh, the, subsection, the subsection 2 says, a person who fails to comply with subsection 1 commits an offense. And, and so that is quite an interesting offense there, wouldn't you say, Mr. Donko? It's a very interesting offense. And the reason why it is interesting is that it is not only the police. Anybody who is authorized to direct traffic on the road. So if no matter whatever it is, even if your uh, the traffic light is even green and the police or the person who is authorized says that you should stop or signals you that you should stop and you don't stop, you have committed an offense. Mm. Let's bring in a bit now of we, Now we can see that there are a lot of people who have been authorized to direct traffic. Yeah. For instance, the national service persons who have been posted to the uh, MTT division of the Ghana Police Service or the, the municipal or district assembly, they have men and women in uniform who have been authorized to direct traffic. So once they are directing the traffic, either motorbike, motorcycle, or a car, you are mandated to stop if they ask you to stop. If they ask you to move, you are mandated to move. So if you do not obey the instructions of the police officer 
or the authorized person who is directing the traffic, you have committed an offense. Okay. And if you are fined liable upon summary conviction, you face the penalty. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me bring in some of our callers. Uh, first, I have George from Dansuman. George, we are listening to you. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, George. Yes, um, thank you very much for bringing this program. Um, I'm driving an official vehicle which, is, which has tainted glasses. Um, well, from the driver's side, you can't see through, but the back side is tainted. Am I committing an offense? Okay, thank you very much, George. We'll answer that one shortly. Um, we also have Rafik from Techiman. Rafik, what's your question? Yeah, good afternoon and then good afternoon to the viewers. Good afternoon. If, if I have a driving license that has a category of driving license C, and then that happens to, in the course of leaving, then I get a motorbike or a car that is driving license B car, can I use the driving license C to write the driving license B car? And so, Rafik, your question earlier was addressed. I mean, the point is that the licenses are in classes is to ensure that you have been trained competently to handle those cars. And so, if for whatever reason you want to drive another vehicle that is not within the class that you are supposed to, you have to uh, inform the DVLA and get the appropriate license. But the question that uh, the other gentleman from Dansoman, George, asked about uh, materials for windscreen, the tinted glasses that we see around. And, uh, the regulation, specifically 67.1, it states that a person shall not drive a motor vehicle unless that motor vehicle has a windscreen, a window or partition made of a transparent material, affords the person driving sufficient visibility for safe driving of the motor vehicle. And so the catch word is it should be transparent. Uh, Mr. Donko, you agree with that point? I perfectly agree with you. Even though most of us are been driving tinted glass, Tinted uh, cars, I think that it is an offense. So everybody, when you are arrested, it will not be a defense that you were not the one who put it there. Because as a driver, as a driver, before you are on board a car, there are certain things, even the law even says that if the brake or other parts of the car are tempered with, that does not make it to function ordinarily the way the car must function, you have committed an offense. So once you are the driver, you need to know all these things before you get on board the car. So if your boss gives you a car that is tinted, you must draw your boss attention to the fact that that car, the road, the road safety regulations does not allow you to drive that car. Okay, okay, thank you very much. I'll take the closing remarks shortly from uh, Mr. Etuyani in 30 seconds. I realize your car glasses are not tinted, but your closing remarks here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, but to add quickly that the same regulation, the law talks about some 70% transmitter uh, level. So it may be transparent, but to what extent? And that's a question for, for DVLA to resolve. We have um, the mechanism for, for indicating that your level of transparency falls within the approved level. But to add quickly to the question that came earlier on, see, when you have a licensee, there's a certain flexibility when you go up. So with a license C, you could drive a B. Okay. With D, you could drive a C and a B. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. And that is all time will allow for today's exciting discussion on traffic offenses and the law. Do join us same time next week. My name is Joseph Akablay.